Um, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here this evening. Um, my name is Laura Mosley. I am the founder of Common Threads Press um, and we are joined here tonight by Jill Crawshaw. Um, and we're very excited because today is a day that has been long awaited for I think about eight or nine months um, that we've been working on a publication with Jill. Um, the publication is called Rights Not Charity, Protest Textiles and Disability Activism and is officially released today. Woo! Um, so this event is to celebrate the launch of the publication um, and I can see a lot of names in the in the um, participants list um, and I know that a lot of you have reached out on Instagram and things like that to share that you have your publication, which is really lovely. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I'm also going to be putting a link to the zine in the chat, but I've also got a special discount code for everybody here this evening. Um, so with the discount code, you can access 10% off. Um, so I'll put that in at some point um, through this evening so that you can access that should you wish. Um, I've got the lovely, lovely job of introducing Jill now. Um, Jill Corshaw is a curator who draws on her experience of disability activism to organise amazing art exhibitions and events which highlight issues affecting disabled people. So Jill has curated exhibitions which have affected, addressed the representation of disabled artists, such as Possible All Along, um, Charity, Piss on Pity, Cuts to Welfare and Public Spending, Shoddy, and access. So the reality of small differences is, is, is an example of that. So Jill is really interested in the intersection of disabled lives with textile heritage in the north of England specifically, as well as with contemporary textile artists. So right now, Jill has just opened an incredible exhibition that is part of Leeds 2023 uh, Year of Culture uh, called Any Work That Wanted Doing, um, which is where artists have responded to Jill's um, research into disabled people who worked in textile mills. Um, we will be talking a little bit more about that um, throughout this evening. Um, so I'm also going to give an introduction to the zine, um, which after you've heard Jill's introduction will make a lot of sense. Um, so I'll read the, the official blurb of the, of the publication. Textiles have long been part of the fabric of disabled people's lives and history. In common with banners of the women's suffrage movement and trade unions, disabled activists have embraced banners as a form of protest and resistance, communicating messages about identity, pride, unity and justice. Rights Not Charity tells the story of these banners. Curator Jill Crawshaw explores this history through the protest banners and political artwork of disabled people's rights movement, taking in political responses to charity, accessibility and government cuts, among other causes. Now, what I'm about to say is very biased, but this is an incredible, incredible piece of writing. Um, the breadth of Jill's knowledge and experience is so evident, um, and it's been such a joy to bring this to light through Alice's illustrations. Um, and I'm just so excited for people to get started reading it and let us know um, their thoughts. Um, if you are still waiting on your copy, please be patient because the uh, postal system cannot always stick to deadlines. Um, but in terms of timings for this evening, we're gonna have 45 minutes of loose conversation with uh, Jill structured around some images. Um, and then we're gonna have 50 minutes at the end for questions. Um, so if anything crops up during the talk, just kind of make note of it somewhere. And then at the end, um, you can kind of pop your virtual hand up um, and we can have a nice discussion. Um, this is the second of our crafting conversation events. At the end of the last one, um, we sent out a survey that got people's feedback and it was incredibly helpful. I'll be doing the same at the end of this, if you could um, fill that out. It's only a couple of questions, but we've already made improvements to this event based on, um, on the feedback from the last one. So yeah, would really, really appreciate that. Anyway, all that housekeeping, I will now share my screen. Um, and one of the pieces of feedback actually was to have visual accompaniment. So we put that straight into, into action. Um, so I want to start by kind of throwing the ball over to you, Jill, and I've introduced you in kind of a very official way, but I just wondered if you wanted to talk, you know, if there, you wanted to kind of give yourself an introduction and talk about yourself, you know, add anything that I may have missed out, um, you know, tell us about yourself. What do you do on a kind of general basis? You know, where are you based? Anything else you'd like to share um, with the, the group we have here this evening? 
Okay, thank you. Well, it wasn't uh, that wasn't an overly official introduction at all. That, that, sound, that was a lovely introduction, and I'm really blushing. I mean, I, I must say, you know, to, uh, I can't remember how long ago it was, Laura, that I contacted you, sort of out of the blue, found out about Common Threads Press, said, well, I'm doing this, you're doing this, maybe we can link up somehow. And that's ended up with this lovely publication. So I'm, I'm absolutely, you know, overwhelmed by that, pulled over. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you as well. Um, yeah, but you ask, who am I, what am I up to? Who am I, what am I doing? Well, I'm, I'm Jill, I'm based in Leeds. Um, I'm a disabled person um, and in recent-ish years um, I've got involved in curating and that's a bit of a, yeah, a, a change of role for me I suppose I haven't had um, a career in the arts or in textiles um, but it feels in a number of ways like I'm returning to a few things that I left yeah maybe unfinished I don't know several years ago I mean I came to Leeds quite a long time ago to study textile design at the University of Leeds. Um, but then I, again, I didn't get a job in the field for a number of reasons. Um, and a few years after I'd finished university, I got involved in the disabled people's movement. I became disabled when I was at university um, and got involved in the disabled people's movement. And particularly uh, after a few years in the disabled people's direct action network, which is also known as DAM. Um, and, you know, obviously, but that's, that's one of the banners that I start with in the book is the Dan banner, because it was a pretty good one. Um, yeah, so I say I, I came, got back involved, got involved in curating just a few years ago, several years ago. Um, and actually, you know, my first exhibition was itself a protest. Um, it was because Grace and Perry's tapestries were coming to Leeds, and this was back in 2014, actually, Grace and Perry's tapestries, The Vanity of Small Differences. And they were going to be in, and they were, in fact, shown in a venue that wasn't fully accessible, so some disabled people wouldn't have been able to get to see the whole collection of his work. Um, and, yeah, that... that when I found out about that, I was quite flabbergasted, really. Of course, it was, you know, because Grayson Perry then was a big thing, as, as he is now, you know, even then, very popular. A lot of people would have wanted to see that exhibition, so it seemed important that, uh, that it should be accessible. Um, and that resulted in a counter-exhibition, the reality of small differences, that was textile-based work to make the connection with Grayson Perry's tapestries, textile-based work by artists in Yorkshire, from across Yorkshire, organised very quickly with no money, um, ended up with two venues. And it was, as I say, it was a protest. So this will sound terrible to, uh, you know, it sounds terrible to me, really, anybody who's involved in the arts and in curation. Because at that time, I was almost, we just need to get something on the walls. It doesn't really matter what it looks like. We just, it's a protest, let's get something that we can have the message. Um, however, that exhibition was a really great exhibition in its own right. Some fantastic work, and I met artists who I didn't know before who were working in textiles. So that was a bit of a start of my curating journey. And as well as being a great exhibition in its own right, it did have an effect on um where it was the council who was putting on the exhibition that we were protesting about, the lack of access, and they did improve the access, certainly. Um, and so that was a bit of a win there. And we got a lot of press every time the Grace and Perry exhibition was mentioned in the press. They would also say, and by the way, there's this other exhibition happening by disabled people. So, yeah, that's what started me. And as I say, that was textiles. So, you know, I think <laughs> one of the reasons that I've, not entirely, but keep coming back to textiles is because I think it's a versatile medium, obviously, everybody here listening will know that. Um, and I think there's quite a lot to say, and it's interesting that there's quite a lot of links between disability rights and textiles. Yeah, I mean, what an exhibition to kickstart your curatorial career on, Jill. <laughs> and also start as you mean to go on, because it sounds like that is the kind of 
style of a lot of your exhibitions since the kind of the, the central theme of that you are responding to something going on in the world that you feel is important to respond to but you know doing it through the medium of textiles specifically um I think that's just you know an incredible kind of portfolio to have built and it sounds like it's been really effective as well you know in, in actually enacting in change so yeah incredible um mm -hmm. I thought um we would just yeah well what we're going to do this evening is we're going to go through these um, images that Jill has really kindly um, collated for us um, and Jill's going to give a little bit of background as to what the um, image is of um, and what the kind of story is behind it and then we'll just have kind of a short discussion based on that so just going to move uh, straight to the next one. Um, so we have got closed captions um, enabled, which do automatically appear at the bottom of the screen, which is um, where the caption for the image is. So if you do want to move this, you can just click on it and drag it um, to wherever suits you. Um, so yes. Anyway, this image, um, I'll just read out the caption. Um, Members of the National League of the Blind taking part in the 1920 Blind March. So Jill, tell us about this image. What's the story here? Yeah, yeah. Well, the National League of the Blind was an organisation of disabled people and a very radical organisation. The more that I've um, learned about them and read about them, you know, I've been really, really impressed. Um, so this was them in 1920. They organised... Um, a march from three places around the UK and marched on London. And there was hundreds of people, marched over three weeks, I think. But what's important in, in terms of what we're talking about is the banners that they were carrying. And one of them in particular, that's sort of towards the back of the image. So, sorry, I don't know whether anybody needs um, the images described. So I'll just say that this is, they are, they are all men maybe unsurprisingly for 1920, um, there's, you know, um, yeah, a march of, I don't know, about 40 men we can see in this picture, but there would have been more on the march. Um, in the 1920 suits, lots of them wearing hats and they're wearing, they've got um, a series of banners. And there's one towards the back, which says, fight for social justice, not charity. Um, and that, you know, is the one that I've, I've honed in on in the publication as well. Because um, the National League of the Blind was set up at the end of the 19th century. Um, and then they were established as a trade union. And Justice Not Charity was actually their slogan. It was their rallying cry right from their early days. So, you know, they were using it before 1920 even. Um, and they were very, very, they were very anti-charity, actually, um, which, as I say, for the time, I think was, you know, really, really groundbreaking and radical and quite, you know, uh, what's the word? I don't want to use a particular word. But yeah, that it was, it was really, really radical to do that um, because they said that charities were exploiting blind people, blind people would often work in workshops, things like that, for charities, that people weren't getting paid a fair wage, for example, and that were that charities were restricting people from getting you know other opportunities really, and those um, themes have come up for the disabled people's movements, and I think particularly arose again in maybe the nineteen seventies, certainly the nineteen eighties and nineties, where the disabled people's movement was really challenging this sort of orthodoxy that that charity was a good thing for disabled people um, on a number of fronts. So yeah, I just think for them to have this banner at such an early stage and that slogan at such an early stage is really quite something. Yeah, I mean, even now, I think that concept of kind of rights, not charity is still quite a kind of provocative statement, I think. Could you talk a little bit about how that sentiment resonates today and whether you you think that's kind of developed or how what kind of role that concept plays in uh, kind of contemporary disability activism? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's maybe it's maybe not as much as a, a, a priority as it used to be, but I think it is still up there because, you know, the important thing about the disabled people's movement is that that is made up of organisations 
that are controlled by disabled people, that are led by disabled people. Um, some of those organisations only have disabled people as their members and, you know, their management committees or whatever. So that's very, a very, very different model from the charity model and the charity model that's, you know, yeah, that's made up of whoever that supposedly says that they act on behalf of disabled people and that they know what's best for disabled people and that's been really problematic over the years and I would say it still is in terms of um, you know sort of segregating disabled people institutionalizing disabled people certainly in the past um, and just this whole idea that disabled people can only live good worthwhile lives if other people are supporting them you know that that's a big issue with charity and of course charity not just around disabled people but other charitable giving sort of sets up this power imbalance that you know yeah yeah you can only have things if other people decide to give you those so that's like the problematic stuff around charity i think charities have learned i'm thinking particularly disability charities here of course mm. i think charities have learned to uh modify the images that they put out i mean you know in the in the mid to end of the 20th century then charities were responsible for incredibly negative images of disabled people i mean i think they were trying to pull up people's heartstrings and get people to give money but you know and, and the other thing was that those tended to be the only images, the only representation of disabled people that there was in the media. So that really, really, really has affected how people see disabled people. And, you know, I, I think that's that was still the case now. I mean, the other thing about the big charities is that they get loads of money. Disabled people's organisations have been decimated in recent years with budget cuts. Um, but, you know, yeah, yeah, there's some very wealthy large disability charities still out there and they tend to be the ones who get to sit around the table with government and make policy and that sort of thing so yeah that's so interesting Jeremy thank you for giving us that context and um insight I think it's fair to say that kind of one model affords disabled people kind of a active role in their own lives and one of them kind of urges them to take a more passive role and one has agency and one one doesn't um and that's kind of what a lot of it boils down to I think um so yeah thank you for that that's um I feel like we could talk about this for ages but let's make sure we get through all these incredible images um so we've got the first block telethon demo from London in 1990 I'll do um, an audio description just so that you can get straight into it okay. um, so we've got a um image here and it's of Lots of people kind of sat and stood um, with a lot of kind of placards and banners. Um, one of them does say rights, not charity, but um, the image is, yeah, from 1990. So it's hard to make out the individual words. Jill, you might be able to add some um, some more insight to some of the, the banners that we see here. Um, yeah, Jill, do you want to give us some insight into this image? Yeah, then just following on from what, what I was saying then. So, you know, disabled people did fight back against charity and did demonstrate against charity and this um as, as you've said block telethon telethon was um on itv a big charity fundraising jamboree that lasted 24 hours or something um they like children in need and there were also incidentally demonstrations outside right. children in need in london and in leeds where i am um yeah, and there was a couple of uh, demonstrations outside Telethon, outside the ITV studios. Um, and I, I did pick this one, even though the quality is terrible. Um, yeah, old photos that have been reproduced many times because it does have um, a banner there, hand-painted banner saying, right, it's not charity. I couldn't tell you what all the rest are. You can see there's angry in one of them for sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. So this was um, loads of disabled people and allies. There was hundreds of people at, at block telethon demos. They were massive. And, you know, the demonstrators stayed there all day. There was entertainment. There was shouting. The thing was that, you, you know, you could see some of the celebrities going in and out. So that was always cause for a bit of a surge around them. I mean, what was interesting about this is, you know, it just... 
it just blew people's minds, I think, that disabled people might not like charity and were angry about charitable fundraising. Um, so as well as having that target of telethon in this case, it was really important, I think, to show that disabled people were organised, disabled people were angry, mm -hmm. and disabled people, yes, as you say, wanted to be in control of their own lives. So I think that's why, you know, these, <laughs> these demonstrations with their banners, with these bold slogans, were really important in, in starting to change some, you know, yeah, some people's opinions, some people's attitudes towards disabled people. And that's really interesting because actually the kind of assumption that disabled people would perhaps be against charity and the shock that they might have caused, that in itself stems from this idea that, you know, you wouldn't expect disabled people to have like an opinion or a say in, in their own kind of fate in their own lives and their own agency. So even people kind of being surprised by that stems from that same belief, doesn't it? Um, it does, yes really interesting okay let's move on to the next one um this is one of my favorite images um we have got this reproduced in the publication um as well um so it's a black and white i presume it's a scan from a newspaper um, but just kind of give the bare bones of the image it's two people carrying a banner that says to boldly go where all others have gone before um and at the bottom it says disabled people's direct action network dan um so yeah jill do you want to talk about this image yeah again sorry for the poor quality but you know <laughs> these are times where I couldn't find any more images, you know, even even in the newsletters that we put out, there weren't necessarily loads of pictures of things. Um, so this is the DAM, the Disabled People's Direct Action Network banner. Um, I'm not sure what the demo is, I have to say, but this is shows uh, pretty good. It shows that fantastic slogan to boldly go where all others have gone before, really emphasising how disabled people couldn't get into places and couldn't get to places. And Down the had um, a campaign for a number of years in the 90s, in the early 90s, around public transport. I mean, there were loads of things, loads and loads of things to um, protest around. We decided to have a bit of a focus on public transport because it was just so key to everything. And at that time, this it predates the Disability Discrimination Act so, you know, public transport was not accessible by a long way. There would have been some buses, perhaps that, um, you know, kneeling buses, as they called them, where, the, you know, the step lowest to the floor, um, but accessible buses with ramps in this country, you know, that was something that unheard of. Um, so, yeah, so as I say, Dan had this uh, campaign around public transport and, you know, we went up and down in the country. And um, what Dan tended to do, one of our tactics, um, which, you know, other, other movements have, have used as well, of course, but we would block roads and use handcuffs. There would be a couple of people who would use handcuffs to handcuff themselves, maybe to a bus or to a train. And at that time, as I say, it's a while ago, isn't it? At that time, um, yeah, the police generally didn't quite know what to do and wouldn't <laughs> wade in. It would take them a while to get round to finding some bolt cutters and cutting people free. I mean, I think, you know, I think things are very different now. And if we look at, you know, Stop and Extinction Rebellion and, you know, I, yeah. I think the police acted very different and the police would act very different, even if it was a group of disabled people. I think, you know, they were nervous then. Um, but I think, you know, members of the public maybe would react differently. At the time when we were doing these actions, there was a lot of support from members of the public because, you know, people thought, yeah, this is absolutely wrong. Yeah, of course you should be able to get on a bus. Of course you should. Um, how can you call it public transport if not all the public can get on so yeah there was i'm not saying everybody was supportive some people maybe were a bit angry if they were held up on the way but a lot of people actually were supportive and you know yeah yeah no go on, go on. i mean can we just talk also about the brilliant uh phrase that has been used on the banner because i presume that's supposed to be a kind of tongue-in-cheek like it's not actually very bold to be going where everyone else can go um and that like yeah the kind of choice behind that wording and as you were saying the kind of likability to the public do you think the banners and the kind of 
symbols and the wording that they used actually were kind of meant to be slightly more kind of lighthearted and accessible in some in some ways. Yeah, I mean, I think it's witty, isn't it? You know, and across the top, which you, is maybe a bit more obscured, it says disability rights, the final frontier. So, you know, really making that Star Trek thing. So it's quite funny. I'm not sure who came up with it, I must say. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's quite funny as well as eye-catching and in your face. Yeah, yeah. You know, other, yeah. And it was a banner that was de designed, you know, to be taken a lot of places. It was good quality. It did sadly get lost, which I think is another slide about that. Um, but yeah, so it was well made and something that could be used in different situations and suited different causes, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah you, you, you're right. It's a Star Trek reference, and I um, did yeah. that on that. <laughs> <laughs> but sorry, it makes it even better, that. actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so this is a really interesting one as well, Jill. Um, I will read it out, actually. This is, again, a kind of black and white scan, I think, from a from a newspaper or a newsletter. Um, and I'll just read out what it says. Um, DAN banner missing in action. On the 2nd second of December, the DAN banner was deemed to be unlawfully attached to the railings at Parliament and removed by an officer of the law. Danners handcuffed to buses at the time were unable to assure its safekeeping. It is now missing in action. If you were at the Rights Now lobby or at the DA in action that day and know where the banner is now, we'd like it back. Description, very large black and with white and pink graphic, disability rights, the final frontier to boldly go where all others have gone before. Um, ring the number with information that will lead to its safe return. Reward a pair of Dan cuffs. So I think you've just given quite a lot of good context to that, which kind of it makes more sense now. Um, but yeah, do you want to add anything else to this? Um, no, that's it really. No, I mean a bit. You know, that is from the newsletter, a bit of uh, a joke thing. But it didn't turn up. Sadly, it didn't. didn't turn up. No, that's no. so sad. So all we have left of it really is that. <laughs> really kind of pixelated black and white image and when was this from what year was this oh like the early 90s early 90s i'm gonna say 94 ish um yeah and it's not the only you know this is what happens to banners though this is what happens you know there was somebody will roll them up somebody will say oh you take it home you take it home in this case in this case you know it was the police that confiscated it which again that happens but yeah Sadly, many, many a lovely banner has, has gone That's missing. True. Who knows? That's true. It might be in somebody's loft. I hope so, <laughs> because the thought of a disability activism banner in the police storage actually boils my blood. So <laughs> I really hope that it's not locked up somewhere in, in the police uh, enforcement. <laughs> um, <laughs> so let's move to the next one. Um, we have a colour image. Guys, this is pretty pretty radical. This image, you can actually see relatively well what's going on. It looks like a road. Um, there's two people holding a big banner um, that says, disabled people fight back, um, equality, nothing about us without us. And then there's a few um, smaller banners in there as well with different phrases. Jill, um, I will let you take over from here and talk to us about the contents of this banner and the story behind it. Yeah, I mean, there's a few of the banners that... Um... Uh, in the booklet that actually also appear in an exhibition at the People's History Museum in Manchester. That exhibition was called Nothing About Us Without Us. Again, this is like, you know, one of the phrases that's used, you, really been taken up by the disabled people's movement. It's again, coming back to these issues around control and who's deciding for who, I suppose. Um, now this banner was made um, at a workshop at the People's History Museum actually, but as you see, well, is it in this picture here, it is being carried on the street. It does get out to demos as well. So it's not just being made, you know, as an exercise or an artwork or something, it's, it's made to be carried on the streets. Um, and it's back, oh, I've forgotten his name. Is it Ed Hall? You tell me, I've just gone blank on his name. Um, the, uh, da, 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 the, is it yeah, Ed Hall, I was right, Ed Hall. Um, oh, Ed Hall is like a really renowned banner maker in this country who makes a lot of banners for trade unions and for other political causes, basically. And he um, was brought in to do uh, this workshop and to make a banner with a group of disabled people in Manchester. And this is what we came up with. And it's, it's just fantastic. And it is in that trade union style yeah. with a number of slogans. And that's all 
larger shape of the image is a curved image with the word equality sort of curving across the middle of it, which, you know, again, really, I think echoes a lot of the, the sort of shapes and imagery used in trade union banners. There's figures in there, there's people with disabled people in there holding other banners around access to work, no cuts, things like that. Um, so, yes, so that I think it's really interesting banner that's in the, the exhibition that's on only for a couple more weeks. That exhibition closes on the 14th, I think, of October at the People's History Museum. It's a really great exhibition of um, crikey, artifacts, all sorts of things from the disabled people's movement. And they've got a really great um, selection of banners in there as well. And this is one of those banners, of course. Amazing. Um, and something I also just wanted to briefly touch on from what you just said, Jill. Um, I think when we talk about protest banners, um, a quite a lot of the histories of it are attached to the suffrage movement or the trade union movement. But just so that we don't presume anyone knows anything about that, when we talk about trade union banners, what exactly are we talking about? And what is the kind of uh, historical context there? Oh, now, so a lot of people might know more than me about trade union banners, but you know, uh, historically, I mean, I think every trade union branch would have had its own banner um, to carry on. Um, yeah, not necessarily protests, but marches shows a strength to have available uh, industrial action if that was happening. But often it would be brought out at things like, you know, May Day marches or, you know, I mean, particularly uh, famous for their banners are the uh, mining trade unions. Um, and of course, you know, they, they get shown at uh, rallies. Um, every year, you know, huge, huge show of banners from the mining community. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the galas, particularly in the northeast, is quite famous for that. Um, but yeah, so those have been made, as I say, for trade unions since probably mid, maybe later nineteenth um, century. So the you know the late eighteen hundreds that um, banners were being made, and they would be textile banners, often silk banners. Um, beautifully painted and decorated. They would have fringing. They would usually be two-sided. So there'd be a picture on the front and the back. There'd be some sort of inspiring message about fighting, about solidarity, whatever was appropriate for the trade union. Um, yeah, so yeah, trade union banners. But as I say, there might be people who are more expert on trade union banners yeah, in the absolutely. audience than I am. And that might be something we could talk about towards the end. I think like the, just to go back to the People's History Museum as well, they have a really incredible permanent collection of um, banners as this kind of the clue in the name of the of museum, but they are huge. Oftentimes they can be absolutely massive and they are so moving. I've, I've always found that when I see trade union banners, I'm like really taken aback um, by what I see. And I think that, yeah, it's amazing to see how the kind of protest banner format has kind of trickled into a lot of other movements like LGBTQ protests, you always see banners. And even now when um, rail workers are on strike, they'll often have a protest uh, banner uh, with them as well, which is, yeah, quite incredible. Um, it just goes to show the kind of how this medium has persisted for over a hundred years, really, and probably before that um, as well. Um, so, Let's move to this image as well, another contemporary image um, that shows a big group of people. Is that outside the, the National Gallery? Um, and yeah, big crowd of people holding signs, um, predominantly including the word BSL. Um, and yes, the caption for this image is photo disability news service. Um, and it looks like it's a, a rally in London. Um, BSL Act Now, BSL equals growth. Um, they're just a couple of the um, signs. So, Jill, do you want to tell us about this image? Yes. Um, yes. I, I was thinking about, well, this, this is probably the most recent image. Is it, There's one of the signs says March 2022. And this was a big rally um, for official recognition of British sign language in the UK and it did lead to legislation that uh, this campaign that has been a long campaign uh, by the deaf community and allies to get British sign language recognised as a language. Um, yeah so this was uh, one of the last rallies I think um, before that was passed into law 
Um, and there's a banner there. There's a banner there that says BSL brings us together, which I just thought was a really great message that emphasises that British Sign Language, it's not just about this particular community who maybe use sign language, it's about bringing hearing and deaf people together. It's a way of communicating and that's that's really important. Incredible. Thank you, Jill. Um, going to quickly move on so that we can get through everything. Um, and another incredible image here. Uh, the caption is Win Visible Protest at Greenwich Town Hall against care charges. And the photo is from Win Visible as well. So this is a kind of smaller group of people. I would say about half of them are in wheelchairs or mobility Um vehicles and they've got a kind of large protest banner at the front that says win visible i think when yeah. visible and invisible disabilities i presume that says and another protest banner says scrap social care charges attacks on disability um jill do you want to take over i just that? yeah i just thought we have to include the win visible banner um because win visible have been going for a number of decades now actually i'm not sure exactly how long they're based in london uh you know and a real real campaigning group of disabled women um you know that campaign around issues particularly i guess around poverty um yeah so they just had to be <laughs> the invisible banner just needed to be represented in this um because it's appeared at so many protests that the organization has organized themselves or many other demonstrations of disabled people so that's why that's one's in here incredible and um there is a link at the bottom here to their website if people want to find out more it's just winvisible.org um and it sounds like they do incredible work so thank you for yeah. um, including them and and letting us know about their work um another one we've got here um uh, DPAC demonstrating with others for the restoration of disability living allowance october 2016 um, a group of people actually outside St Mary's House in Norwich, if I'm not uh -huh. mistaken, um, uh -huh. which is my hometown. Oh, I can see it says uh, Norfolk in the corner of one of the banners now. So, um, Jill, I'm going to hand this straight over to you because there's a lot of banners going on in this image and you might be able to get some more insight to them. Yeah, so DPAC, D-P-A-C, Disabled People Against Cuts, Again, you know, a really, a really now important organisation that's been going for a number of years, not as long as Win Visible by any means. And, you know, some people have said, well, these, this is uh, the organisation that sort of picked up the baton um, from down from the Disabled People's Standard Protection Network. So DPAC have done loads and loads of, of work around challenging cuts to benefits and public services and research to point out how disabled people have been really affected by this. So this is from um, a few years ago in your right, it's at Norwich. Um, well, I'll come back to why I chose this one. I mean, I, I quite like it. It's a, it's a long picture with a lot of placards and a string of people outside this building. Um, and, you know, the, the DPAC logo, again, their banners, come up time and again now in the disabled people's movement and they've been tackling you know cuts and issues around benefits on a number of fronts and so yeah one of those banners talks about that it's talking about scrapping the bedroom tax scrapping atos which was an organization a private organization that did the um fit to work assessments that disabled people had to go through a number of years ago so there's sort of a number of bullet points on the banner really loads of information packed in then there's another much more homemade looking one that says rights not games so this was thinking about you know yeah the Olympics, the Paralympics, the Commonwealth Games and how much money is spent on that. Could it be better spent elsewhere? I guess the question is here. And I won't go into too much. It says dead people don't claim, because there's another image coming up um, that's relevant to this one. Dead people don't claim and DWP deaths and talk. There's a number of things on spray paint. They're all crossing over each other on that one. But yeah, again, really, really important to have DPAC. The opening slide actually was another lovely DPAC banner um, designed by Brian Hilton. Again, we'll be seeing more of Brian and Wadi Ahmed's banners. Um, 
yeah, but these are, you know, both a mixture of sort of the quite neat banner and the very homemade banner here. Amazing. And yeah, just um, we do, um, rep we in the zine, we've replicated or Alice has replicated some of the symbols into um, illustrations just so that we kind of have a, a closer a closer look in a way at some of the logos and, and look at, and study them a little bit more closely so that's um something and this one is another one that we've recreated via illustration in the publication as well yeah um yeah. so do you want to just quickly talk about this one and then we'll move straight to talking yes, about we better move swiftly on. No, we better move swiftly on sorry i'm probably no, you're, no it's my fault too um, so two banners in the, so that the spray painted banner that was in the previous image was sort of an earlier work by Vince Laws. Vince Laws is an artist based in Norfolk and he's been making a series of what he's called shrouds. They, they, yeah, they're banners, they're carried on demonstrations, they're displayed, um, you know, at meetings and events and all sorts of places. The series is called DWP deaths make me sick, DWP being, being the Department for Work and Pensions. And um, these shrouds, is made them by using stencils and spray paint on old sheets, but they're really, really, really powerful and in your face. And what they're about, they're, they're commemorating the lives, but also being angry that, you know, it's come to this. Um, commemorating the lives of people who died um, while they were assessed as being fit for work by the DWP. So that's why he's got the title of this series of works. Um, and this one, you know, one of them is Jacqueline Harris, former nurse, I'm reading from it, um, could hardly walk, found fit for work, benefits stopped. That's the thing, when people are found fit for work, it means their benefits are stopped. Stopped. Um, so that just completely cuts their lifeline, literally. Um, she was desperate and took her own life. And then he's used this slogan, right, stop in the next one, justice, not charity. Stephen Hill awaiting major heart operation, found fit for work, month later, died of a heart attack. So yeah, but there's there's absolutely loads scores of these banners because so many people, um, one way or another have been, yeah, had their benefits cut and died. Many of them, you know, you'd say directly as a result of that. So yeah, really important, um, really important. And these really straddle being artworks and being, you know, protest banners and being tools um, of the movement. Yeah, so I think really important work by Vince. Yeah, I mean, incredibly important work. I mean, yeah, gives me gives me goosebumps. Mm. Um, so we've got two more slides before we just go on to talk about the zine. Do you want to give quick overviews of these, Jill? I think Quick, it's important to quickly, and you can read about them in the booklet. Quickly, the last one was some banners again, like a straddling art and politics, I suppose. Um, a couple of banners that were part of a parliamentary um project a couple of years ago by disabled artists, though. So let's skip over those. Uh, they're amazing banners. Yeah. You'll have to read the zine if you want to find out more. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and now I was being a bit cheeky and put these in, which are they banners? Are they wall hangings? What are they? But these are from uh, any work that wanted doing the exhibition that's currently on in Leeds that, that I've organised. And these, I chose these two works both, well, for a few reasons. I mean, they're textiles, they're very, very large. Both of them are very large uh, works. There's a wall hanging with tons and tons of detail on the left. And it's called My Sisters Hugged Me to Work by Becky Moore and Becky Cherryman. And um, the exhibition, I should say, I think you mentioned is, is disabled artists who've responded to some research I've been doing on and off for years around disabled people who worked in textile mills. And the purpose of that research is to show that disabled people are part of the world and disabled people contributing. Yet, we've been largely erased from history and it's trying to put that right. And also sort of, you know, bringing in contemporary issues as well. So the work um, by the two Beckys, it comprises a poem and then there's this huge flowing patchwork. And the patchwork is made up of, of course, patches of fabric, but there's also within the patches, sometimes the, those patches are turned around so you can see the hexagonal template that the patches are made around. And those templates have got all sorts of detail. There's archival photos, there's quotes from people 
old quotations, but also contemporary quotations about disabled people's rights at work. Um, so, yeah, you know, it, it sort of serves as a banner and it's got all that sort of layers of meaning and political meaning in there. So I thought it was quite relevant to show it, really. Um, then Integrated Society Likewise, which is by Rhea, another of the artists, in any work that wanted doing. And Ria's just thinking about integration, living in um, a flat, actually in a converted textile mill as it happens, um, and a flat where she gets some support to live there, as do some people in the block where she lives, but not everybody. So she's been thinking about integration and how important that is, how important that is for everybody, not just disabled people. Wow, thank you. I mean, if you can get anywhere near Leeds anytime soon, I would suggest you go and have a look, of course. Um, Jill, how long is this on display for? It's on until uh, early next year, till January next year. So, yeah. Plenty of Drop time. your line if you, want to, if you want to meet there. Yeah. <laughs> well, OK, great. So the reason we're here, um, although I think Jill has probably just given the best advertisement for this zine that anyone ever could, because it is clear how much knowledge and experience Jill has that um, is so, translated so well into this um, publication. Um, so these are a couple of the illustrations. Um, Alice has created these from some of the photos that we've just looked at. Um, so you can see kind of recreations of some historic banners. Um, and kind of creative interpretations as well. Our designer, Chris Shaw, has also taken some of the older photos um, that we've looked at this evening, reproduced them in the in the zine, but then also just reproduced some of the wording and kind of pulled out elements so we can see that a little bit clearer as well, um, kind of creative interpretations of historic banners. Um, so this is a little bit of a look inside. So on the right is just, just what I was talking about there about how Chris has taken some of these um, symbols and phrases and just to kind of emphasize the importance um, of the wording that's often used in these protest banners too. So I also included the spread on the left here just so you can see what the inside um, looks like. As you can see we've included um, context to some wording that people may not know or may not have come across before um, so there's no presumed knowledge in this publication as there isn't with any of our publications. Um, so that's it in terms of slides. Um, I will put a link, I'm going to stop screen sharing now, I'm going to put a link to the publication if you are interested and want to purchase it. Um, and I've also got to set up a discount code, especially for the people here this evening, if you want to get it. Sorry if you've already got it and you've missed out on the 10% discount code, maybe you can order a copy for a friend. <laughs> um, but thank you so much if you've already pre-ordered it. And I know for a fact some people uh, in here this evening have done. Thank you so, so much. Um, we can't wait to hear what you think. Um, so I'm going to stop screen sharing now and we're going to go on to the section where we can all chat together. Um, so there are 21 of us in here. Um, so if you don't feel kind of totally confident turning on your camera or your mic and chatting, you can pop your question in the chat and, and I can read it out for you. Um, whilst people are having a think, I'm gonna get the link for the zine and the discount code and put that in the chat as well. Um, if you have a question, feel free to just switch on your mic and ask it, or as I say, put it in the chat. Um, right, link to the zine. So this is a link. And the code is launch event 10. So okay. you get 10% off um, any copy of Rights Not Charity that you may like to purchase. Fab, fab. And I was going to say, if you've bought it already, I mean, get, yeah, get in touch with me, maybe via Instagram or something, and I'll. I'll send you another little, another little zine, um, yeah, as a consolation for not getting your <laughs> discounts. <laughs> um, Jill, can I, it was at the start of the presentation, but can we just pop your email address in the chat so that, because if people yeah, might yeah. at the start, so that you, if you can, um, if people want to contact yeah. you. Are do. you doing that or shall I do that? Uh, yeah, I can pop it in, it's just jill oh. at gmail.com, isn't it? It is, yeah. So if you have any further questions that you want to follow up with Jill, um, you can send them to us or you can send them directly to Jill and um, we'll make sure they get to her. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have any questions about the publication or about Jill's experience or just about disability activism in general or protest banners in general, 
um do feel free to get involved this is a chance for us all to chat together um but also i know that it can be hard to think of questions even if you really enjoy the chat so no pressure <laughs> even if you just got kind of thoughts or your own experience um in a kind of similar area that you want to kind of open up a discussion on feel free to um yeah yeah no, that's fine. Um, yeah, no, I was just wanted to say, Laura, after you were talking about um, the format of the book, how that works really nicely. The illustrations are lovely. And I just think because, because there aren't necessarily photos or the photos we have are maybe a bit grainy or not fantastic. And I know that's a house style as well of common threads press to use illustrations, but, you know, to have that, that creative recreation of the banners I think works really well really yeah, nice Alice has yeah. done a fantastic job um I would suggest following Alice on Instagram um because this is really their kind of ballpark um they're also really invested in disability activism as well they're at I'll put a link to their Instagram um in the chat so you can give Alice a follow um, oh, we have a question in the chat, yes. from Belle. I will read it out. So, yeah. have you found a big difference in banner styles between regions within the UK? I grew, I live in Scotland, but I grew up in England. I've noticed some differences in the way images are used at protests. Oh, I don't know. Now, that's something I haven't thought about before. That's interesting. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'd be interested to hear what differences you've noticed, actually. I mean, you know, I'm a northerner and I've um, spent, you know, all my adult life in the north. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure about that one. But yeah, if you want to, if you want to type something in the chat, that's an interesting. Yeah, I mean, Belle, if you've noticed I'm look out for. <laughs> I was going to, I'm sorry, I was just going to say that, um, Belle, if you have noticed any differences that you want to share, it would be really interesting for us to hear that. Um, anything you've observed? Oh, camera. Ooh. Hello. Hello. Sorry, my oh. internet's not brilliant, and you're currently on a device sitting on my lap. So <laughs> sorry, it's a bit wobbly. Right. Um, yeah, I've noticed a big difference um, in Scotland uh, from where I grew up in the south of England, but also I think a big difference between the north of England and the south of England. There seems to be a big um, kind of shift. I've noticed in Scotland, some of the, you get a lot of Scottish imagery. So you're very rarely far from a saltire or some heather um, or a, like there's a lot of excellent punning that seems to happen. A lot of Scottish, uh, especially like um, in Scots, uh, there's some really great puns that come out. Um, but I wasn't sure whether that was just because I've literally moved from the south of England up to Scotland and it might be that uh, there's differences everywhere else and I've just managed to like jump over them <laughs> in between. No, that's nice. That's that, Yeah, and that makes sense as well. And I like the idea that the Scottish banners uh, sort of got witty puns and that's something that's really quite noticeable. Uh, so a lot of tenants-based puns and tonics tea cakes-based puns. <laughs> like there's a lot of, you know, stuff going on there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, really appreciate it. That's really nice to hear. Um, we I got a direct message from Lucia um, who has to go, but just wanted to me to read this out. Um, they said, this is really interesting, especially because of the sensorial slash tactile quality of textiles and how that is key for visually impaired people as a communicative slash expressive tool. I just wanted to share these textile practices decrying the production of visual impairment by police violence in Latin America um and it prompted her to make her own so i'm going to put those links in the chat but to everyone so that everyone can see it um and then we've got a note from luna she said this has been brilliant thank you i was wondering jill's thoughts about the experience slash importance of communal banner making spaces in the disabled people's movement and trade union movement as spaces for organizing and knowledge sharing etc i'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on this jill because this is something that we've worked on recently with the um trans joy community quilt so yeah these kind of communal communal spaces for making in disability activism yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. Yeah, it is important. You're right. Yes, yes. I mean, not all banners are communally made, but yeah, that is really, yeah, it is, it is um, 
what would you say, you know, a, a tool isn't the right word, but is a way to bring people together and a way to share thoughts and a way to maybe prepare for an action. And maybe, you know, it can it can G people up and bring people on board who might not have been part of, you know, who might not have been part of a campaign or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, it is really important. And that's, I mean, obviously today we're, we're focusing on banners, um, but in terms of, you know, textiles more broadly, those are, and of course I know all sorts of people are using textiles, yeah, but I think, you know, that, that, disabled people they can be a really accessible um medium and that other comment that uh, wow yes i'm really looking forward to finding out more about those and seeing those links um yeah you know because people can it's relatively cheap people are finding materials that are to hand they're quite portable and they're things that you know that you can hold on your lap and work on but yes i mean it is that's just really important and yeah yeah many's the time that you know people come together before an action, before a demo, um, to make a banner together. And people are still doing that, of course, aren't they? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, Leslie has said, wonderful, thank you. Please can I give a plug for Stored Out of Sight, History of Disabled People on at Hastings Museum until 16th of December, including Leslie's storytelling coat from Shoddy and Deepak slash Arts for Rights at Tate Modern in 2016. Um, so it sounds like, Jill, you may already um, know about that work. Uh, yes, I know about the work and I've heard about the exhibition, which sounds really good. Yeah, so yeah. yes, do give it a view. You've given it a plug. <laughs> very welcome um fantastic so we've got one minute left if anyone wants to kind of put a last minute question in the chat get your money's worth because we've got a minute left <laughs> <laughs> um and yeah just in case anyone missed it i did put the link to the publication and the discount code in the chat um that you can access but if you've got any questions feel free to send us an email um and yes, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. It's been such a delight. I actually feel quite moved by this conversation. Um, and it's just been such an honour to be in your presence, Jill, and to hear all of this incredible knowledge that you have. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for being so generous with sharing it with us. Um, and you're getting lots of thanks in the in the um, chat as well. Um, as I said earlier, I'm going to send around a feedback form. It is so valuable. I know that when you go to events and things, they're always spamming you with a survey at the end. But when uh, instances like this, when it's kind of a DIY volunteer run organization, we basically run off feedback that people give us um, for directions. So I'm going to circulate that. And if you could please fill that out, we would really, really um, appreciate it because we can use it to make these events even better. Um, so I will stop the recording now. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. And uh, thank you, Jill, for being here. And I hope you all have a lovely weekend. Thank you. Yeah.